reading this morning is from John chapter 14, verses 1 to 7. Jesus comforts his disciples. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Chris. I'm one of the curates here at St Paul's. Um, I found out before the service that two really important things happened uh, 30 years ago on the 24th of June. One of them is that the Flood family moved in to Bournemouth. And the other thing is that this church burnt down. I'm not saying the two are related. <laughs> Correlation is not the same as causation. They teach you that when you do maths. But I'm not certain, which relates to our service this morning, which is all about certainty. Um, we con I'm continuing with the next, next part in our series called Distinctive Living. It's about what makes a difference when you're a Christian. And this morning I've been asked to think about certainty in a world where everything is relative. Now, I was born in the 70s was a child in the 80s and broadly became an adult in the 90s. And if I have a love that is away from my family, then it is for musical worship and 90s indie rock, which I can tell you makes Spotify's AI algorithm really confused. Uh, I was looking at one of my favourite personalised playlists the other day called 90s Mix, and it has the track I Worship Your Almighty God, which is a lovely, lovely song, followed immediately by Radiohead's Fake Plastic Trees, <laughs> which is a banger of a track, but it does leave you with a slight sense of culture shock as the music switches from one genre to another. But I'm learning to embrace it. It's good. Anyway, as I say, 90s indie rock, it's, it's, a, it's a love. And in September 1998, the Manic Street Preachers released an album entitled This Is My Truth, Tell Me Yours. And that is relevant to this morning only because we live in a culture that says there are no absolutes. What is true for me does not have to be true for you. We want to believe that every faith, every ideology, every political system is equally valid and one person or group of people doesn't have a right to question the validity of any other person or group or their beliefs or values. Everything is relative. And the problem is, is that there are absolutes in this world. I'm sorry to say uh, there is an objective reality. I can choose not to believe in gravity, but I still can't fly. Although I will keep trying. Um, it would be quite cool. But if you think everything is relative and my truth isn't your truth, then how can you be certain of anything? That's what we're thinking about this morning. So before we turn to the Bible and what it is that Jesus has to say to us this morning, let's just take a moment to pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you that uh, we trust you, that we are here this morning to listen to your voice. Lord, I just pray that you would speak to us and help us to be certain of you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, in our passage this morning, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when, we say, when he says that, we might get a little uncomfortable. We might get uncomfortable because that's a really exclusive claim. It's not very inclusive at all. But when Jesus makes the statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one 
comes to the Father except through me. He's saying that he is the only way. It's an absolute. If you've got a Bible in front of you or you've got it on your phone, then feel free to open it up to John 14, um, verses 1 to 7, just so you can make sure I'm not talking complete nonsense. So, the first p- words of this passage are, let not your hearts be troubled. And we tr- tend to treat this like Jesus has just started speaking here. I mean, that's all we've heard this morning. Um, because it's the first verse of a new chapter. But Jesus has been speaking for a bit now in chapter 13. Um, this is just the next sentence in a longer message that he's been giving to his disciples. They're actually in the upper room, observing the Passover on the night that Jesus was going to go on and be betrayed by Judas. So he's just told them that one of them, one of his disciples, is going to betray him. That Peter himself, the most confident of them all, would even deny knowing him three times that night. And that he, and that he Jesus, would only be with them a little while longer. And that they couldn't get to go where he was going. They had left everything. They'd given up their jobs, their families, and in some cases their spouses. Uh, although I'm sure they got home from time to time. Holy Land's not actually that big. Um, But they weren't going to be able to follow Jesus or be with him any longer. So, yeah, their hearts were going to be troubled. Just imagine if you've given up what you were doing as your day job and you've gone off and you've travelled and you've you've given it all up and now it's just going to come to an end. Something is changing, a significant time of change. Your hearts would be troubled. They were devastated. Jesus was upset. He was going going away. He was going to be betrayed by one of his closest friends and denied by another of them three times, all in one night. That's a rough night. Have you ever felt like your world was crashing down around you? Like the plan you thought that was panning out was just coming to an end? Like your, world, like your world was changing too fast and the things that you were absolutely sure about are now wobbly and uncertain. And it feels like one thing comes loose and flaps around like washing in a strong wind. You catch hold of a bit, but the clothes on the rest of the line are coming loose and there's no way you're going to catch them all. It can feel like a losing battle. And there are times when the speed of change seems so fast and things are crashing down all around us and we're uh, in danger of being overcome by fear. Maybe a relationship has come to an end. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe your job is at put at risk or just comes to an end. One thing goes wrong, then another, then another, then another. And that's what Jesus sees in the eyes of his disciples. Their hearts were troubled. Our hearts are troubled. And Jesus sees that and he reassures them. Look at verses 1 to 4. His answer to our worries is to trust him, to trust that he is going to the Father to prepare a place for those who follow him and that he will come back to gather his own to himself. In a world filled with uncertainty, in a world that today denies that certainty can even exist, Jesus says, you can trust me. I am here, I am faithful, and I will follow through. (coughs) What I have promised you can consider done. In John's Gospel elsewhere, we're told in this world, you will have trouble. That's John 16. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, you will be persecuted for standing for what is right. You'll be persecuted for following me, is what Jesus says. But Jesus says this as well. Know this, when you follow me, when you trust me, your life here on this earth will have meaning and purpose. So when it is over, I have a place ready for you in my Father's house. So when life falls apart, when uncertainty and insecurity raise their ugly heads and remind you that this world is fallen, that it is broken, remember what Jesus says, I've got you. Even in death, I've got you. And I have to include that even in death because we don't like to think about bereavement, we don't like to think about loss, uh, certainly not with respect to our faith. We want a Jesus that makes our lives easier and our relationships better and our businesses more successful. We don't want a Jesus who asks us to pick up our cross, die to ourselves and follow him. We don't want to think about a Jesus who sometimes, in fact, in some places of our world, often asks his followers to trust him in death. 
We don't want to think about a Jesus who allows that kind of suffering, but it still happens. And we can't stick our heads in the sand like some kind of ostrich. The Apostle Paul wrote this, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord. When he wrote that, he wrote it for a reason. He knew that's what many Christians would face. When Jesus was arrested, why did his disciples scatter and flee as he was led away that night? Because they were in fear for their lives. There were soldiers with swords. So of course they pegged it. And yet those same men and women who fled that night would carry the good news of Jesus by foot and by boat to the ends of the known world in the face of Jewish persecution and in the face of a resistant Roman Empire. They would endure unbelievable hardship. They would all, every single one of them, die a martyr's death. Some of their converts would be burned to death or beheaded or forced to face fierce and wild animals in the Roman arenas. So why didn't they run? Why didn't they just go, no, no, I don't mean it. I didn't mean it, you're absolutely right. What changed? I think two things changed. One, they were certain. They had certainty in Jesus that he was the way, the truth and the life. And it became more than a poster or a slogan for them. It became their bedrock, their foundation. In an uncertain world, the reality of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, became their sure and perfect foundation. Take a look at verses 5 to 7. Jesus says, I am the way. Jesus both shows us, in him, shows us the way to be forgiven and reconciled to God, and he is in himself, in his being, the way itself. Jesus is the connection between God and sinful human beings like you and me. Now Hebrews 10 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, now those holy places are the presence of God, since we have confidence to enter the presence of God because of the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his body, in other words, uh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near, in other words, draw near to God, with whom we were estranged before we trusted and followed Jesus. We can draw near to him with a true heart and full assurance of faith. I'm really sorry, Paul writes, re the writer of Hebrews does really long sentences, but he does, but you, when you follow them through, with a we can draw near to God with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, just a few minutes ago, we baptised Amelia. It was beautiful. And why did we do that? And we did it because as Christians, we hold that this is a sign of what God has done through Jesus. <coughs> and we have certainty in what the future holds for us. Before Christians were called Christians, the followers of Jesus were known as the people of the way, a different way, a people who walked a different path, who lived differently as they walked through this life. When you become a follower of Jesus, you become one of the people of the way. We live like we are living in the kingdom of God in the here and now. As we move one day at a time towards an eternity with our creator. So another claim that Jesus makes is that he is the way into the presence of God. The way to be reconciled to God. The way to live life well here and now. How can he say this? Because he is the truth. And what's truth? Now our, our view of truth today is that which aligns with reality. The person who is telling the truth is the person who is stating what really happened. Even if it means they'll get in trouble. Now, for us, in many ways, truth has become something you say. But in the ancient world, they had a slightly more fuller understanding of what truth was. To be a truthful person meant to be utterly dependable. To speak the truth, to follow through on your promises, and to hold to your word. In a sense, there is something about being truth. So when Jesus says, I am the truth, he is claiming to be that ultimate reality that's in alignment with the way that things are. 
He's saying that the things he says and the things he teaches are truth. He's saying that the things he does are truth and that he is utterly and completely and perfectly dependable. His promises hold not just because his word is truth, but because he is truth. And not only is he the truth, he's also the life. Nothing exists apart from him. Not you, not me, not your friends and neighbours of this world. The cosmos itself has life only because he is life. Now, back in John chapter 1, the introduction to this same gospel, uh, John says, All things were made through him, and without him, not anything, was m- not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. St. Paul in Colossians says, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is the source of life, and he is life itself. He restores things that have died. He restores the broken and the destroyed. He cleans up messes and makes lives new. Jesus is that breath of fresh air that never ends. Real life in a world that is far too often dank, dark and stuffy. He is the way because he is the truth and the life. And no one, absolutely no one, comes to the Father apart from through Jesus. He isn't a way, one of many. He is the way. It's exclusive, only. Some of you will know that my day job is to run an information department for the local hospital. It's dull. Say la vie. But statistics tell me that one person, Jesus, would have had a one in 100 million billion, that is one with 17 zeros after it, a one in 100 million billion chance of fulfilling just eight of the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. Only eight of them. He doesn't fulfil eight of them, he fulfils all of them. Over 300, I can't be bothered to do the maths for that. It's just a step too far, even for me. Several, he fulfils several of them just by circumstances surrounding his birth. More than could possibly have happened by chance. Two things I trust in life, Jesus and maths. Mostly Jesus, because my maths is terrible. But as human beings with inherently sinful hearts who are lost, Jesus is the way. As human beings, we can be very intelligent and yet are still so ignorant. And at those times, Jesus is the truth. And we are dead in our sin and separated from God. Jesus is the life. Now, I said two things changed for the disciples. First, they anchored their lives to Jesus, who was the way, the truth, and the life. And the second, they were filled with the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, God's empowering presence. God, not just as an idea or a word on a page, but living in you and living in me, bringing us strength to walk the way who is Jesus, to know, speak, and live the truth that is Jesus and to experience his life. A few minutes ago, as I said before, we baptised Amelia and we made these declarations of faith. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, who died for us and rose again? Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? Those are statements that the church has made for 2,000 years because we are certain of some things that Jesus alone is the way, that he is the truth and the life. It's exclusive. No other way, no other truth, no other life. He is our anchor in the storms of life and the secure foundation upon which our lives are built. We will face uncertainty. We will face struggle. We will face pain. We're going to be challenged in this life. That is certain. But even more certain is Jesus. Are our lives built on him? Let's pray.
Lord God, thank you so much that your Bible says that I can trust you. Lord, I want to trust you. Show me one small way that I can trust you today. I want to declare your faithfulness with certainty to those around me so they will put their faith and trust in you also. Lord God, show us who we can encourage today. In Jesus' name, amen.